Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and today we are doing our Deckle Sea Shells project from our, oh, sorry, Ooh, ah. uh, from our Along the Coast box. We have Michael here working the cameras. We're married, so sometimes we say things as married people would do. Um, we are going to be doing this project in three steps and I just want to acknowledge that we are actually painting two different paintings simultaneously and I designed it that way. Okay, so our very first step is we are going to be putting in the under like cream washes on our seashell to the left and then the ombre washes on the seashells to the right. Our second step is we are going to be putting in the dots on the left and on the right we'll be putting in the texture lines on the right. And then the last step is we will be adding a little extra shadows wherever we feel like we need it and just finishing details. Sweet. Okay. Um, as you can see here, I have two pieces of five by seven paper already deckled that I've taped to my um, surface. And I want to say that for the outline, the outlines came on one page and something that I do to help me make sure I center my outlines correctly is I'll actually cut them out from the page so then I can make sure that they will be centered on my paper. Okay, I just wanted to share that tip with you. For the colors that we're using for this project, we have this custom palette set that we've um, curated from Art Philosophy. So the colors are Sassafras, Jellyfish, Shadow, Sourwood, Crabapple, and White Mocha. If you wanna have a butcher tray palette handy so you can mix colors in that area as well as here, feel free to. And I'm using two paint brushes around two and around six. These are my go-to brushes. Clean water, paper towel, and Holbein soft tape to tape everything down. Okay? Sounds great. All right, so let's get into it. So if you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. Thank you. And I love starting that way. It's just a great reminder that the whole point of this is just to experience something new and learn and play. That's the point of life, you know? Um, okay, now before we start on the wash, I wanted to bring my palette here to you guys already used and messy so you can see how I like to clean it. Because what stopped me from using cake pans for a very long time is I didn't understand where to mix. I didn't understand any of it. I was afraid to mix in my palette because then the colors would get all messy and muddy. Well, my friends, you just got to do this. Pure gasoline in a spray <laughs> bottle. This is water, clean water. And then I just take my paper towel and just rub off the first layer. That's it. And then you have your pure color again. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. You can take these ed like trays here and um, like run them under water and just rinse them. Or sometimes if I don't feel like moving them, I'll just... Take a paper towel and wipe. Piece of cake pan. Piece of cake pan, that's right. Okay, here we go. And I just mix so I'll pick up I'll pick up like a blush and a blue at the same time and then mix them, or sometimes I'll mix right in there. I really give myself freedom to mess these up because knowing that I can just wipe them clean with clean water makes me feel safe to do so. Okay. I'm gonna grab my six. I'm gonna start with the painting on the left-hand side and then we'll move to the one on the right. I'm gonna grab some of this gorgeous blush color. I love this color so much. It's such a good color. It's very blushy. It is, it's lovely. And sometimes I like to throw some of this like white mocha in there. It just kind of like grays it a little bit. And um, you can add a tiny bit of red. Sometimes I just like to mix a bunch of the colors together just to see, but what I'm going for is kind of like a soft blush. So you can use straight just this color or throw a couple other colors in there and just see what happens. Okay, so using this color and my six, I'm gonna go along the edge, put that color in, and then use water to just kind of spread it around. And if you go a little bit outside your outline, that's not the worst thing in the world. Just 
just like that. And then sometimes while it's wet, like I'll grab a little bit of the gray blue and mix that in there just to give it more of a gray color. And then kind of in these areas where we can see that there are these like indents, we'll just drop a little bit extra color in there just to give it a hint of form and shadow. This is going in and then, then it's also turning away from us. And if you need to blend those out a bit, you can. Okay. And then let's actually take this peachy color, add a tiny bit of yellow. And I'm going to do this little lip right here. And the very last thing we're going to do is we're going to take this peachy color, add some red to it, add more peachy. So you see how I'm just like grabbing and mixing directly on. And then let's gray it down. So let's grab some of this shadow. Let's grab some of this yellow and blue. There we go. And we're painting like the inside or the underside of the shell. So I'm going to take this like grayish, like a really dusty rose color that I just mixed. And right at the tip here, try not to touch it into the wet surface. I'm gonna put that color right at the tip and then I'm just gonna blend it out. And if you can, leave like a little thin white line in between so it doesn't bleed, or you can use your heated craft tool and just let it dry before you attempt this. Okay, and that's it. We're gonna leave that for a second. We're gonna move on to the ones on the right. Now on the right, I really wanted to do this like ombre seashell feel. So on the bottom, I'm gonna start with like a very blush peachy color, then it's gonna get warmer, and then it's gonna go more like a corally color, okay? So, I'm gonna take my blush color here, pull it out, and maybe I'll mix in a tiny bit of that kind of dusty rose color. It just desaturates it. It's just such a lovely color. And using, starting at the bottom, I'm gonna put that color in. You can either start at the bottom or the top, just wherever you start, rinse your brush, hit it off the side of the cup so it's not super wet, and then just spread it around. It's just a very light wash. And then while it's wet like this, if you want to like put in a little extra color here along the top or along the bottom, it's just gonna diffuse out. And if you look at different seashells, and I believe I might have gotten these names wrong, but I believe these are um, cockle shells. And I believe this is a cardinal miter. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly at all. I've never heard these words before outside. <laughs> I've only read that. <laughs> so I'm not sure. And honestly, Michael and I spent about 20 minutes before this project trying to research and make sure that we have the correct ones because I can't remember the names when I was looking at reference photos and I'm mad at myself. But Also, miter in this instance is spelled M-I-T-R-E. So it might be a cardinal Mitre. Mitre. <laughs> we don't know. Roll you... Mitre. Mi, mitre. I it's can't French. roll my R's. They're French, obviously. <laughs> but if you do know, let us know in the comments. And sorry if I'm saying it wrong or if these aren't even those right shells. So sorry about that. Okay, now as you can see, I'm starting to get some like blooms and textures. I love it. I'm embracing it. I'm saying thank you, watercolor, for doing some hard stuff with me. Because if you look at these shells, they have inconsistencies in them. They have pops of colors here and there. Sometimes they're like evenly white. There's so many different options and variation that allow your painting to have variation. It will just match what we would find. Okay, now the one above. Same thing, and if you want, you can just do the wet on wet technique where you just use water to wet the whole thing. And then I'm gonna take some of this lovely peachy color blush, grab a little bit of yellow, and uh, just drop it in. I just want it to feel like a slightly different color than the one underneath. I'm, I'm not going for exact colors here. So I'm obviously thinking about food, watching you paint, because that's who I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these little shelled creatures are all in a class called mollusca. 
oh. or mollusks. Uh huh. Uh, you know, along with octopus and squid and snails and oysters and scallops, all of the things like that. Okay. And it got me thinking. It's funny that I love oysters and I love calamari and I've had octopus, but like eating snails still weirds me out. I've had them, but it has a different feeling. But in reality, that like the same creatures. Yeah, that's true. You know, I didn't think when we went to France, we tried snails and um, it, it just tasted like whatever it's cooked in. Like I didn't, it kind of reminded me of mushrooms a little bit. Yeah. It didn't like weird me out per se. I think it's just because I feel like when I think of eating a snail, I think of a garden snail and I Mm. think of like dirt maybe, but I think snails that you eat are raised to be eaten. You know what I mean? They don't just like go out and pick garden (laughs) snails. Let's go get dinner. (laughs) I don't know. They could. I really don't know. As you can see in this seashell, I'm dropping in little hints of yellow, maybe a little bit more of that pink color on the bottom. Um, Usually I try and keep like the darker values along the bottom and the top, but there are some shells where there's like a line of pink, like a vein of pink that runs through it. So really um, play here and let colors drop and blend and do all sorts of things and embrace whatever happens. Um... I actually feel like I just want to do a couple more drops of that yellow across. I liked how that looked. Okay, beautiful. And now the top one, I'm going to take this uh, red color and let's grab some yellow. I love that red color. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. It's like a coral and a salmon almost. And then just kind of work it along the top. Rinse your brush. Spread that color out. I was the pickiest eater as a child. I just am giggling at myself that I just had a talk with you about eating snails. <laughs> you know? I never would have thought. And I'm dropping more blush in this seashell. Were you picky? Yes. Gosh. <laughs> I mean, yes. I didn't like anything. You didn't like pizza sauce. I, I didn't like that. pizza sauce. I would eat spaghetti with just noodles and cheese. I didn't like fish, all of that stuff. But so um, my bonus dad introduced me to a lot of foods like sushi. And all I would have never probably tried it if it wasn't for someone being like, just try it. Just Lynn, give it a try. Lynn also introduced me to sushi. He introduced a lot of people to sushi. Okay. So that's step one, and now we're going to move on to step two, um, which we're going to put in the dots on our seashell here. Now, um, I just want to say the benefit of working with two paintings simultaneously is one, um, you're less likely to overwork because your focus is spread between two. Two, it gives you an opportunity, like this has to dry before I can move on. So instead of using a heated craft tool or whatever, I'll just work on my other painting. And so it's just more efficient I think and um, especially if you were to do like two paintings within the same vein maybe not the exact same ones but seashells like we're doing here then like if one does not work out that's okay because you have another one and then it doesn't feel like you wasted anything even though I would argue that just taking time to paint at all is never a waste no matter what happens Okay, so to start on my dots, I'm going to grab yellow, and I'm actually going to do a layer of yellow on all of these dots first. And remember, um, you, the outline is a guide for you, so you don't have to follow it exactly. You can do more dots. If you forgot a dot, you can eyeball it. Maybe I shouldn't call these dots. Maybe they're like speckles. I don't know. But I'm just giving you permission to change it up. And then almost immediately, I'm going to mix an orange using red and yellow. And to darken it up, let's see what happens if we put a little bit of blue in there. There we go. I have to amend a previous statement for all the haters out there. Okay. 
Mollusca is not a class. It's a phylum. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. It's just like in what level they're organized. Oh, okay. Like a phylum is over classes. Now, when you put the orange, the dark orange in, let some of the yellow still be seen. So I'm not covering the entire yellow section. I want some of that yellow to pop through. And that's just going to show that there's variation within the color itself. The bottom of that shell looks like a smiling whale mouth. Yes, it totally does. Hey. Uh -huh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this kind of dusty color, mix it with some of this blush to lighten it up. And you see this lip here, this yeah. line? Yes. I want to show that there's like an actual bump. So I'm going to, on the left-hand side where there's no dots right now, I'm going to put in a tiny, like, little of that darker value. You can use your two or your six. And then I'm just going to blend it out because I want it to feel like there is a lip there, a little bit of an edge. And then if you touch the yellow and it kind of like blends out a little bit and bleeds, I actually think that's really, really cool. So I don't want you to feel like you're ruining it by messing it up. Also, these dots, like this is a three-dimensional shell. It moves around. So sometimes we'll just see the start of a little speckle. Yeah, sometimes I just like to smear this yellow around. It just is beautiful. Just creates a really lovely wash that's barely there. Okay. Now we are going to move on to the right side, my step two, which is we're putting in um, like a little bit of medium values to add a little bit of form to our seashells. So this section right here, this kind of like curve where it comes out, I'm just going to to darken that and then use my brush and kind of blend it out just give it a little bit of roundness underneath and try and match the hue with whatever value you're putting down so here I'm going to stay within my peaches here whenever I put in my medium values there's going to be some warmth to them because that's the wash underneath and here it's going to be that kind of more corally salmon color um, underneath so it just is consistent with the surface that it's on and then let's actually switch my two and see how that feels using my two I'm going to grab like a medium value and I'm going to just start to put in these lines now these lines kind of angle towards the middle here Then I'm going to rinse my brush and I'm just going to kind of soften these lines. So then we still get the value, but it's not um, like it. Mm, it just is like a softer transition. And if you want, you can have the lines connect all the way to the bottom up to you. Sometimes I'll just take the color that's already there and just kind of smear it all the way down like so. And sometimes along the top where it kind of like curves in, I'll do an extra little shadow right in there to really make it feel like it's doing this. You see that? Mm-hmm. And sometimes like this bloom that happened in here actually created this really lovely line um, that I'm slightly obsessed with. So I don't want to mess that up. But if you want to put in like, I don't know, a little bit of color or a line here or there, you can. Okay. All right. And now we're going to do the same thing on the middle one. So I'm going to use that same kind of peachy blush color. 
add a little bit of yellow to it. Take some of this kind of dusty rose. Maybe a bit more yellow. And then just start to put in these lines. Now I'm being pretty loose with them. That's my favorite kind of painting. Me too, actually. It's just, I feel like there's always, when you paint loose and just like drop in color and let it move and all this stuff, it doesn't matter how often you paint something it's, there's always going to be an element that's different, that's unique, that creates visual interest. And I just kind of love that. I think this also relates, I play guitar, I don't know if you guys in Llama Land know that, but th I think of a lot of things um, in terms of music also. I think the loose painting is my favorite because to me it really displays what an artist really paints like. Because if you I don't know, if you do drills enough, you can paint something exact. Mm -hmm. But seeing what someone leaves out, seeing what gestural directions they take, seeing what the looseness actually translates into, to me, I don't know, is where the art lies. I think the same is in guitar because I love, you know, shreddy guitar. Mm -hmm. But there's something different about someone just playing fast and someone playing... I don't know, you would call it soulful or something. Mm, but mm -hmm. to me, that's the difference between loose painting and like photographic yes, painting. Yes, like photorealism. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that there is a difference between technical ability, which is kind of what we're talking about here. The ability to render something very realistic takes real skill. And I don't want to downplay it because right. there are, I mean, like Chuck Close is probably the artist that I'm familiar with that is a famous fine artist who does photorealism paintings and portraits huge. Like they're huge and they look incredible. So incredible. And that's a style. Like that is valuable and all of that stuff. I don't want to downplay it. Play it. But... When we allow ourselves to have our own interpretation on what it is that we're seeing, it gives our viewer the ability to see the world through our eyes. And I think that's why I'm, I hope that you guys feel the encouragement where I say, paint this in whatever colors you want and all of this stuff, because how we see things how we experience our world. I mean, art is the closest way that we can communicate our human experience in our own world. And what's wild to me is like, I have no idea if Michael and I could be looking at the same thing. And does he see that as blue? Or does he see that as green? Or what, like, there's, there's just such a range. And I think that when we allow ourselves to make artistic decisions based off of our own experience and our own mind, that's the closest way that we can invite people to live inside the world that we are experiencing. Absolutely. Okay, that was step two. Now we're gonna move on to step three, which is just kind of like tightening it up, finishing details. So I wanna go back in here and take this Dusty Rokes colors now that it's nice and dry and just really kind of sharpen up that lip, like so. And then if you really want it to feel like, oh yeah, that's like going in there, right at that tip, right here, it's gonna be an even darker value. I have one more thought on the, you know, technicalities talk we were just having. In general, in my experience, the best of the quote unquote soulful players are hugely technical. You learn the foundations. Yes. And most of, you know, in the guitar world, most of the the greats that you know of could shred, per se. Mm -hmm. They choose not to. And I think that probably applies in art also, where, like, having great technical foundation is never a bad thing. It gives you the ability to create what you want. Like, right. it doesn't... 
stop you from being able to do or make what it is that you want to make. And sometimes people, if they see someone who paints something that's a little bit like wonky, you assume that they don't have technical skill. Picasso is an excellent example that comes to mind. I mean, his style is, um, what did you call it? Cubalism. Cubalism. It's <laughs> cubism. <laughs> um, and, but see, I'm sorry. if you were to see some of his earlier work, I mean, like, the the paintings that he was painting when he was, like, 10 years old will blow your mind. Like, his skill as a 10-year-old surpass, surpasses mine currently. It's insane. And you can actually walk through his work and see, okay, this is when he was learning the techniques. This is when he was really building his skill set. I mean, it took years and years. And then you can see him start to explore and say, I wonder what it would be like if someone could look at a person or thing or horse from three different perspectives. And that's how we started getting these like sections here and there and this and it, the perspectives were all different perspectives simultaneously. And that he was able to get there by first understanding color, value, form, all of those things that we're hopefully learning now. He was like a master before he started even really experimenting with the things you know him for. Yes. Yeah, that, that really changed my perspective of him, that museum piece where it said, like, he wanted to paint a horse, but you wanted to see all sides of the horse at once. Yeah. And, like, you're like, oh! Oh! He's not just being weird. These all are actually... There is reason yeah, behind it. Yeah, it was really cool. But anyways, yeah, the point of my... point of the story, I think, is that, like, people get really... I don't know if this is in the art world. In the guitar community, people get really up in arms about like, well, that person doesn't know what they're doing. They're just playing fast or vice versa. That person has no, you know, technical skills. They're just like playing soulful. But I think that the best combination is when you, you know, embrace both. Yeah. Learn the foundation so you know which rules you can break. Absolutely. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> Okay, this feels good. So this is where I'm just kind of like checking it all and just being like, can I put a little bit of a darker value here? Or what happens if I were to, um, does it need like a yellow hint of a speckle here? Should I smear this? So um, kind of just any finishing touches. I went back in and I tightened this. I wanted a value change, darkest value being at the top and then it kind of lightens as it goes down. And that's because we're showing that something is continuing to go in and underneath. It's like a tunnel in there. And so how we communicate that there is like, it keeps going is this value change. If we were to do this all in one value, especially if it matched the sides here, it would look like one surface. So I'm trying to communicate, there's a few surfaces in there and in the middle it goes. Okay. The deckled edge paper really makes a huge difference on these little ones. You know what I, I mean? I know, and I just want to show you that sometimes you can do the simplest painting, the simplest three-step painting that takes you 10 minutes, and sometimes just pairing it with a clean deckled edge, that, that it's beautiful, it's beautiful. We don't have to spend hours and hours and do this fully fleshed out painting for someone to stop and say, I like that, or that reminds me of what it feels to pick up shells along a beach, or something like that. Okay, so now I'm going back to my right hand side and same thing, just any kind of finishing details that I think would benefit. And I actually feel really good about this guy. I don't wanna to touch him, I think he's lovely. This one I'm gonna sharpen a bit and this one I wanna add a little bit of vibrancy to. So I'm gonna grab some more of my yellow and red and just kind of along the top here, put in that bright color. And you can even do some dry brush technique to create like an uneven texture. That feels, that feels good now. I don't wanna mess with that too much now. And this one I'm just gonna kinda of like blend out a bit, soften. Still thinking about Picasso. Um... Going to art museums has been so beneficial to my life, Sarah, because I don't know if I would have if I was not married to you. Mm -hmm. 
But in reality, you go to an art museum and you think of someone like Picasso. And if you don't know anything about Picasso, you go like, I don't know why he's famous. That's so silly. Mm -hmm. Why is he a classic? Why is he one of the greats? I don't get it. Mm -hmm. But you get there and like, you don't even know what you don't know. Yes. You're just a child in this world that is so (laughs) fully fleshed out. And like, people know so much about art. Mm -hmm. And you just, I, I guess that's my phrase is, you don't know what you don't know until you go there. You don't know what you don't know. And I would suggest if you're looking at an artist or a painting and you, you like, especially if you think of like abstract expressionism, like Jackson Pollock with the splatters and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Helen Frankenthaler is another excellent one. You look at that and you say, I don't get it. This is a square with dripped painting in it. How is this beneficial? And if that's running through your mind, some great questions to ask yourself is, how can I read and understand? Because artists usually do things for a reason, right? And so sometimes you can read about it. Like, just read about it. Like, literally be like, why did they paint like this? Right. And then... When you read about it, it gives you that perspective and it gives you a new understanding. And you can still not like it. Not liking something is just as valid as liking it. You don't have to like it, but you can sit there and say, oh, I understand it now. And so sometimes just doing a little bit of reading and research, asking questions, allowing your curiosity to bloom and just be like, hmm, that's a really interesting technique. I wonder why they decided to do that. Sometimes artists create paintings just for the process aspect of the feeling of dripping paint, of the feeling of splatter, of not thinking about anything and letting their consciousness dictate whatever they paint not trying to say this is a tree or whatever, um, which is just a fascinating aspect. And you're like, whoa, that's, I wonder what I would make if I wasn't even trying to think about it, you know? And so, um, and our painting is done, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) We're done here. But I guess it's always good to also see things in person because let me tell you, I will admit that Picasso is not my favorite. I respect him completely. His artworks just aren't some of my favorites. However, when we were in MoMA and we went to that fifth level and we turned the corner and there was a Picasso painting of these ladies. I think it's five of them. Do you know what I'm talking about? I remember it, yep. I literally gasped. It took my breath away. I was so blown away by it. It was just... It snapped my attention and sucked me in and I walked directly. I mean, there was Van Gogh Starry Night right there. And I was just like in it. And I think it's also really important to experience things in person too. It's great to do research and all this stuff, but see it. See how it makes you feel because I promise you, there are going to be paintings that give you a reaction inside of you that you would not expect or anticipate. And that is the beauty of art. Two, that is the beauty of feeling, looking at a painting and being able to feel it. And you're going to feel something different than me and Michael and whoever else is next to you. You're going to be walking through a museum and you're going to stop and you're going to look at something and say, wow. And I just think that's such a wonderful way to spend your day. Okay. We're done with our paintings and I'm actually going to remove the tape so we can get that full effect of the deckled edge with our painting. And when you remove the tape, you wanna work slowly. You wanna pull the tape away from your paper at a 90 degree angle. And of course my whole mind soft tape doesn't let me down. I love it so much. We should buy stock in that company. <laughs> Just for their tape alone. Yeah, seriously. Now, with a deckled edge, you might get a little bit of that edge kind of peeling up, but the beautiful thing is it's torn anyway, my friend. So a little tearing in your paper is not going to uh, hurt it. I know that you're fully in love with the soft tape because now you're making excuses for its poor behavior. <laughs> you're like, that tear didn't count. <laughs> Tears don't count. <laughs> not with this tape. <laughs> not with this tape. <laughs> this tape never tears. Oh, but when it does, it's on purpose. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. And then you want to really elevate it. Grab a pencil right here. Boom. I mean, does that not look like a legitimate piece of artwork? Can you even deal? It is a legitimate piece of artwork. (laughs) 
I know, but sometimes a deckled edge and a little signature is just, okay. Thank you so much for painting with me. I hope you had a good time. I hope you can see the value of working on two different paintings simultaneously and how just a little deckled edge and a soft wash with blooms can really create an elevated piece of artwork. Um, thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.